Good morning. Welcome this morning to Hope First Baptist Church as we celebrate um, this day. Uh, we celebrate the last day of this year and uh, the looking forward to the coming of a new year. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us. Especially want to welcome any guests that are with us today. And uh, thank you for joining us online as we do worship our Lord and Savior. Uh, just a quick reminder. Uh, remember to check the, the Christmas card boxes out there, see if uh, there's any boxes for you, and um, check that out. Um, what? Cards. Christmas cards, <laughs> yeah. There's plenty of boxes, but don't take them. Yeah, yeah. check for, for cards in, in the appropriate boxes. Um, next, next Saturday, gentlemen, man, there is a men's breakfast down at Duck Creek Gardens. Uh, you are all the men are invited to come and join us at eight o'clock for a, a fantastic breakfast and, and time of fellowship. So, so please remember that. Also, out on the counter is um, the the tithing boxes. If you tithe by envelope, uh, please stop and, and pick up a, a box. We are trying to be good stewards and using up a surplus of boxes from past years. There are no names on, on the boxes, and the dates don't align properly. Um, so, but if, if you do um, tithe by uh, the envelope, pick up a box, and please, for the first two or three weeks, write your name on the envelope as, as you turn it in. That way Sarah can keep track of that and assign you that number that's on that card. So uh, if you have any questions, please see Sarah about that. She'll straighten out what I didn't say right, I guess. <laughs> All right. Uh, will you join me in prayer this morning? Our dear Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to come and, and gather here on this day and worship you. What a joy it is to worship you any day that you have given us life and breath. It is good to gather, that we can share our concerns together, share our joys together, come and, and the, the fellowship that strengthens our bond, dear Lord, we just give you the credit for that. We thank you for uh, the opportunities that we've had over the past week to to meet with family and, and celebrate the birth of your Christ. We, we thank you, dear Lord, for, for that time and, and for safe travels back and forth. We thank you, dear Lord, for this past year, for the many blessings that, that you have given to us, for the many miracles and answered prayers that we have seen through this past year, dear Lord. We thank you, dear Lord, that you were with us during the times of trouble and trials, dear Lord, that, that even th though some were, were difficult, we stand on this side of those trials and we celebrate you. We look forward to next year and, and the promises that you have in store for us and the blessings that you have in store for us. May you guide us and direct us through this next year as we continue to, to do the things that you would have us to do. Dear Lord, in, in the midst of, of celebrations and, and of life and, and joy, dear Lord, there are 
troubles and trials. We pray for several families, even within this church, dear Lord, that have had loved ones that, that have uh, gone home to you, that have died some tragically, um, some suddenly, dear Lord. We just ask that you would wrap those families in your arms of comfort and love, that they may feel your presence during this time. We pray for families that have loved ones that, according to the doctors, don't have much time to live. We ask that you would be with those families, and, and dear Lord, if it be your time, may they feel your presence. We pray this morning especially for for Cindy Gosney this morning as she goes back to the hospital. We just pray that you would work with the doctors. We have seen your miracle in her so many times. We pray, dear Lord, that you would continue to, to touch her body, that she may regain her strength once again. We pray for, for others that, that have sicknesses, dear Lord. We pray for Missy Tressler's father that, that is dealing with shingles this morning. We ask that you would ease the pain and discomfort, that you would protect his eyes and his sight from the shingles. We pray for others that are going through surgery, going to surgery in the next weeks. We ask, dear Lord, that your hand be involved in the surgeries, that it may go quickly in the healing process be quick also. We pray for those individuals and those families that are caregivers, dear Lord, that you would sustain them and give them strength, give them encouragement, dear Lord. Touch the, the family member that they are caregiving to, that they also may be strengthened and encouraged. We ask your blessing upon Dennis and Molly this morning as they celebrate their anniversary this weekend. We just ask that you give them the blessings poured out upon them. We ask this morning that the words that you have given to Stephen may, may be spoken clearly. Dear Lord, that we may understand and that we, we, we may carry those words with us today. Again, as we come this morning, we, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you, dear Lord, for all that you have done for us. We pray this, that you would be glorified. Amen. Reading from Psalms chapter 33 this morning. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre. Make melody to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Will you stand with us this morning as we sing?
I heard that, uh, that carefully worded prayer. May the words that Stephen has to say be understood <laughs> and spoken clearly. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have, I don't really have any big words. Well, okay, I guess you can't go by my standard of big words, but I'll make some bigger words if you'd like, Sheila. Uh, you know what? Let's do it. I'm just going to start making stuff up. I'll start making words up. You, you won't even know. So, Yes, as the Spirit leads. Thank you, Lucas. As the Spirit leads, I will make words that the Spirit gives me. Well, it being the seventh day of Christmas in the traditional church calendar, the traditional church Christmas season, there's really no better time to talk about the Incarnation. Um, Usually it takes me a week or so to figure out what I'm going to preach if Dennis, asks, if Dennis asks me. But actually I found out within an hour because this is rather simple. Because it is, Dennis speaks a lot 
of this time of year especially about how mysterious the incarnation is. And I have to admit, in the more I understand the incarnation, the more I'm mystified about it, paradoxically. The more I know about it, the less I know about it. And in these past years of my life, I really have been, and the, this is a good word for it, mystified by the incarnation. If you have not been mystified by the reality of God becoming man, not, where you've just sat and been mind-boggled, if you haven't had a good mind-boggling over this topic in a while, you probably haven't thought about it long enough. Because it is strange and weird, but glorious. The reason I wanted to talk about it is because there's a lot of, there is a lot of common misconceptions floating around in our culture about the God-man, right? About Jesus Christ. One of them is perpetual baby Jesus, is what I like to call it. He never grew up. He's that little baby in the manger, and of course there's this gold glowing aura around the manger with freshly cut hay billowing over like a, you know, a, a gardener, you know, like a landscaper made it, right? That's perpetual baby Jesus. And he never li- he's always that innocent, right? He's, he's basically a baby, even as an adult. He's a baby at heart, right? That's perpetual baby Jesus. Closely related to that is angel face Jesus, you know with long, curly, flowing, glistening hair down to his rear end, right? And then a beard here, you know, and, uh, you know, sapphire blue eyes, Aryan Jesus, right? You know, his, you know, long blonde hair, white skin, white creamy skin, which I find strange being a Middle Easterner, but, you know, it's, it's Renaissance Jesus, right? And it's just, he's, he's always, and he walks around, he has the same expression every time, every emotion, it's, Right? It's the same expression, angel face Jesus. And then closely related to that is Jesus the more than a man. You know, his poop doesn't stink. You know, that kind. Does he, does he even poop? Right? He's the, he's the son of God. Can we say that about Jesus in church? Right? He didn't, he didn't, no bodily functions. Right? He basically floats around. And he can just look at you and you know something's different about this man. Oh my gosh. He must be an angel or something. What, when by all accounts, he was just as normal looking as you or I. Just as average as Larry, you know? <laughs> like if, I had to, if I had to pick a standard of average, Larry, that he, he's about right there, right? <laughs> Everybody say hi to Larry. I'm right, yeah. You're welcome here anytime, Larry. Um, there was, a, there was an art movement in Victorian England called the Pre-Raphaelite Movement. That's what they called themselves. You probably would even recognize, if you were, even remember any of your like, art classes, electives in high school or wherever, you probably might even recognize a couple of their paintings. But there was one in particular by uh, John Everett Mille was his name. Um, it was a painting of Jesus in his father's shop. And he'd cut his hand while woodworking. And he was bandage, bandaging it up with G, uh, Joseph there. And this painting caused an uproar in Victorian England. People were scandalized by the idea of Jesus cutting his hand in the woodworking shop. Which I find extremely ironic since he would get too much larger scars on his hand later on and his feet. Amen? Amen. I, but I feel like it's less, the uproar was less about the fact that Jesus was bleeding. Well, that was bad enough. Jesus, the Son of God, bleeding? <coughs> Excuse me. I think it was more about Jesus making a mistake. As if the idea of Jesus had to learn carpentry. <laughs> He's the Son of God. What are you talking about? When he was born, he had the knowledge of a 60-year-old carpenter who's been carpentering all his life. I think people were scandalized by the fact that Jesus made a mistake. Jesus had to be taught carpentry. Didn't he know every name of every tree when he was four years old? Because after all, he's the son of God. This is the more than a man Jesus that I'm talking about. 
He's something more than a man. And I think that episode, I wanted to tell you about that painting and the uproar it caused, because I think that typifies. And I think it just goes to show that humanity is not looking for Jesus the way he came. This is something very strange and foreign to us. We are looking. It's not, this wasn't just a Jewish problem. It wasn't just the Jewish authorities that had a problem with some blue-collar carpenter from a hick town claiming to be the son of God. This is an epistemic problem for humanity. There's a good word for you. Yeah? This is, this is a systemic, there's another one, problem for humanity. We are looking for something more than a man. We're not looking for a blue-collar car, uh, blue carpenter from the Middle East, from a podunk town like Hope. We're looking for Captain America. Right? We're looking for Superman. Somebody that is, and it, well, more than a man. Very God-like. But if he is a man, he's got to at least, there's, he's got to be legendary. And he's got to have resources and status. Batman. Right? Tony Stark, Iron Man. These are the, just look at how idolized these figures are in pop culture. Just look at like the Epic of Gilgamesh or whatever. Look at Greek mythology. We're not looking for Jesus. We're looking for, that's better. We're looking for Captain America. We're looking for Superman. And we have been since the dawn of time. But it's the wrong idea. And we will miss Jesus and we will miss our only means of salvation if we keep on looking for Superman and forget to look in the manger. There is something incredibly supernatural about this, but that is because what was earthly or what was unearthly became earthly. It's supernatural just because of how natural it is. I mean, think, I just want to, I'm going to put a pause. On this. Think about this. The first cause, you realize everything exists because God exists. Everything exists in him. And he can't unexist. That became a human being. Now just, just sit in that for a minute. There is something supernatural going on here. And though we cannot comprehend the fullness of the incarnation, we are called to understand its significance, which is why I am here today. And for 1990, I'm just kidding. Right, Dennis has to throw that in every sermon, so I did too. I'm going to take you across nine different scriptures today. Don't worry, they're short ones. But this isn't just, this is as if to say, this isn't just something we made up as Christians. This is to show us this has been in the process. This has been brewing for a long time. And so we're going to go from Old Testament, New Testament. We're going to go all over looking at where the incarnation pops up and what it means. Listen, you'll, we will never be able to grasp the incarnation. It's too wild. But we can understand what it means for us. And that's what we should do. So the first place I want to take us is to Hebrews. Might be my favorite book of the Bible. That's, that's, that's tough, though. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 2. I don't know if you follow along. There's, it's going to be on the big Bible. I think. Yes, it is. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. That's a lie. No, not that, not the verse. That, that's not the first place I was going to take you. I'd scrolled down too far. John 1, 14, Paige. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, wait a minute, that ain't right. Okay. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory. The glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. If you want to get a verse that talks about incarnation and the strangeness of it, this is probably the first place a good Christian would go. John 1. The prologue, as it's called. The word became flesh. Now that Greek word, that Greek word, 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 right? Logos, it is. 
This, it, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, apparently text to speech misunderstood me. It's not first cars, it's first cause. That word means, has attached to it in the Greek sense, first cause, not first cars. It has to do with the, the dynamic power of the creator's will. Why does everything exist? Because God wills it. If he did not will that it should exist anymore, it would not exist anymore. All he has to do is think it. Because everything finds its existence in him. He is the first and primary cause of everything that's ever happened, everything that's ever existed. And that logos, that word, became flesh. Now, look at how that's worded. It, didn't, it doesn't say transmorphed into a human. Right? He didn't change anything about his identity as God. He just became flesh. He didn't lose any of his godness, but he is 100% human and 100% God. Just the way that he became flesh. He did not lose any of his deity. That is strange, that he can be a man just like you or Larry and God at the same time. And this is my favorite part of this verse, dwelt. You've probably heard this before, but that word, that word means pitched his tent. In the Greek language, what that is, is he, he pitched his tent. So he tabernacled. He tabernacled among us. Some, some uh, theologians like to word it that way because that's the sense you get from this verse in the Greek. He, he got some pegs and he pitched his tent among us and he lived. See, it's not just Emmanuel now. Emmanuel is God with us. I mean, after all, God was with Moses in the desert, right? Well, this is different. God is dwelling among us now. How many of you have heard of the game Among Us, right? Yeah. And you're trying to look for the murderer. It could be him. could be her. could be anybody. You're looking at the faces around you. Well, get this, guys. Get this. If you want to find the first cause, the primary cause, you want to find the word look among us because he's a man his name is Jesus Christ now is that not weird the God who was once in highest heaven infinitely dimension like he's on a dimension we can't even comprehend he's, he's outside of time we are temporal beings we measure our life by time he does not what, is hap- what will happen a thousand years from now has already happened from God's perspective. He is beyond time. He holds the universe in his palm, figuratively speaking, right? The first cause of everything who is as far away from us as he possibly could be, especially because of sin, now dwells among us. That should blow your minds. God was unapproachable before, and now he's among us. He's one of us. Just sit in that for a minute. I'm getting, I'm getting some, I'm seeing the smoke rise from Howard's ears. I know there's a lot of gears turning then, right? I just want you, just sit in that for a second and imagine the word became flesh. That is the first glorious certainty that we get from this one great mystery called the incarnation. But the second one, this is Hebrews. Now you can go to Hebrews page. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 2. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. Now, there's two verses here, and I want you to notice what I noticed, the two contrasts between the long ago and these days. Do you see that? Long ago, God spoke to us. In these days, you see the contrast? The the writer of Hebrews is comparing two things. There was long ago, 
and there is these days. There were the prophets, now there's the son. He spoke to the fathers, but now he speaks to us directly. And there's an implicit contrast going, here, going on here. Many times, he spoke to us many times in ways, implying that, okay, there's one time, and then we wait and there's another time. Versus the gospel account, which is an ongoing message for everybody at every time at anywhere. You may not be able to understand the incarnation, but I need you to understand this. We now know, because God became man, we now know personally the mind and the heart and the plans of God. There is no mystery now about how God feels about us or what he's going to do with us because God became a man. And God's ultimate will for humanity was displayed and carried out by that man. There is no mystery. There's no meditating for hours upon hours trying to transcend yourself and reach the supernatural. Guys, let me tell you, this new age philosophy that is so uh, just everywhere, pervasive in our culture. It's all about getting outside of yourself and reaching the divine within you, right? How many religions in the world are based around that? No, there is no mystery. You couldn't do that if you wanted to. You probably didn't know it until God told you. But you are a sinful being and can't hope to transcend and get into heaven. That's why he had to come down. Because he wasn't going to leave you where you are. We know there's no mystery now. God's not hiding how he feels about us. We do have to wonder, gee, he might, he might just send me to hell when I get there. I don't know. I hope I've done well enough. All I can do is try. Try my best, right? No, there's no uncertainty now. God became a man and told us and showed us what his will and his heart was like. And it was to save us. And that takes us to Isaiah 9-6. Classic Christmas verse. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, prince of peace notice and dennis has pointed this out before and he's done so well in doing so notice that we go from child to son in other words before it happened he was destined to grow up and become an inheritor we go from a child a boy which doesn't have much significance unless you know that boy grows up to become a son. That word is different, meaning the kind of son, a son who inherits. This child isn't going to stay a child. There's no perpetual baby Jesus here. He's going to grow up and he's going to inherit something. What is he going to inherit? Well, look, the titles that they give him here, the titles that Isaiah has for him will give us an idea. Wonderful counselor. He will counsel us in the right way, not like the leaders that sometimes we don't know who to vote for because we know they won't lead us in the right way, right? The leaders we've been hoping for, the leaders we wish we could vote for, he will be that leader. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, God himself will be this son. Eternal father, father, this son is going to be a father as well. A father who loves and cares like a father should. And he will not stop being our father. He is eternal father. Prince of peace. That's my favorite. I don't know about you, but I'm really hankering for some peace long about now. And he is going to be the source and maintainer of peace forever. That's the son that we have gotten. He will be the leader that we all have been looking for from time on end. He will be the man who really does fix everything. 
he really will bring about peace on earth and goodwill to men. Actually, not like the ones we sometimes feel we're forced to vote for or some of the ones we get that we didn't ask for. He won't be that counselor. He will be the prince of peace. How is he going to bring about peace? Well, I'm glad you asked. That takes us to John 3.16 and 17 because 17 often gets neglected. For God's so, or I've started saying it. I like, I picked this translation because I love the way it words it here, which is how it is in the language. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, to save the world through him. Okay. Now, he has been given. In other words, Jesus is a gift. Now, we can't receive a gift that we can't comprehend. Right? You can't unwrap a gift that's not wrapped in a way you can unwrap. He can't come to us as God. He has to come to us as a man. He can't come to us as the transcendent God. He has to come to us as God as a man. Now we have him. And our salvation is secure because we have him. Why did he need to become a man? He did it so he could save us. How? Because he needed to die. God can't die, but a man can. And the only way to save us from our destruction was through death. And our God was willing to do it. He could die as a man. And, and he could rise again as a man. He had to become a man so he could do both. And because he died, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But instead, salvation. Because he perished in our place. Now we will not perish. And he resurrected on our behalf so that we too may be resurrected. Actually, physically, you will come back from the grave when God says it's time. Because he became a man and did both for us. And it's available to anyone. Before, it was only to the Jews through the fathers, right? The prophets had a message for a particular people at a particular time. No more. This is for everyone, everywhere, anytime. Because God so loved the world. Zechariah 9.9. 9. Now, what does this salvation mean for us? What does it procure for us? Well, let's take a look. How are we to feel about it? It tells you right here. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Look what's happening here. This also gives you an idea of why Jesus told his disciples, go look for a colt, go look for a donkey on Palm Sunday. A king, one who has, get this, get this. For ages, the king has always been up there. You have to get, you have to be, have real status or real wealth to get an audience with the king of any nation. In fact, you wouldn't really even have any, if you were some peasant, you wouldn't have any basis for knowing that your king even existed. You never see him. All you get is his decrees. Well, how do you know he exists? That is how far away the king was from his subjects. This is not that kind of king. This king has lived in the hovels that his peasants live in. This king has lived on his subject's level, and he is coming to us. We're going to see him and hear his voice. And through the righteousness that he upholds, he will ensure God's blessing to all his subjects. Now, there is no, there's no, no symbol in the Bible is insignificant. God always has a good reason for choosing it. Why on earth a donkey? It's not a war horse. Think of John 3.17. God did not send his son into the world the first time to condemn the world. 
And that's what everyone in Jerusalem was expecting. For the Messiah to come riding in on a white war horse and vanquish all the enemies. And boy, we'd have a geopolitical miracle of Israel from now on until evermore. That was what every Jew was looking for. For the Messiah to come riding in on a war horse. No. God did not come to vanquish his enemies. He came to save them. That's you and me. He came to save them. It is not time for war yet. It is time for salvation. Donkey's not a war horse. It's a beast of burden. He came to do labor. What was the labor? He came to not only the cross... Because that wouldn't be good. What's the point of dying unless there's something significant? Okay, what's the point? He died. He had to be innocent to die on our behalf. He came, get this, and upheld the law. The work that we're called to do, but cannot do. That's the curse of sin. We're still under the law of creation, called to be what God called us to be at creation. But we can't do it because we decided, eh, not today. And we ate of the tree of forbidden fruit, right? Now we can't do the work we're called to do. So he had to become a man so he could do the heavy lifting for us. Church, you do not have to think about have I done enough? Have I done it well enough? You do not have to do it because somebody has done it for you. The king riding on a donkey The beast of burden has done the heavy lifting and done the labor for you so that you could reap the rewards when he gained nothing in the process except death. And what were donkeys used for? Work and to carry burdens. If you were taking a pilgrimage, you put your stuff on the donkey and walked alongside it, right? He is going to carry a heavy, heavy burden and he's going to drop it in an empty tomb. And, without going too far about this metaphor, he's going to be stubborn about it. He's going to be as stubborn as a donkey about it. He's not going to let anybody, anything, anywhere get in the way of the labor he came to do. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising shame. No insignificant symbol in the Bible. All right, what else? What else does it get for us? Galatians 4, 4 to 5. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, hmm, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. He fulfilled the law for us to redeem us all. And this is one glorious truth that comes about as a result of that. Look at this born under the law, to redeem redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Church, if you ever wonder why God had to become a man, remember this verse. Since God the Son is now a man, men can be adopted as sons. You were as far away from God as you possibly could be with no hope of getting close. And now, because God came to us as a man, you are a child of God. Because God the Son is one of us, and also God the Son, we get the same rights as Jesus Christ himself, the second person of the Trinity. Let that blow your minds. Because of Jesus and what he did, because he became man, you now share the same status as the second person of the Trinity. You have received adoption as sons and daughters into God's family. And remember, when you, Dennis has said this before, when you see sons, don't be offended, all ye females. Only a son could inherit back then, especially in Hebrew culture. So when you are called sons, O ye females, be flattered. Because 
an earthly family, at least back then, you couldn't inherit anything. But in this family, you receive all the rights of the second person of the Trinity. It doesn't matter what your gender is. And it's all because God became man. Titus 3, 4 to 7. But when the kindness of our God, the kindness of God our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out his spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that having been justified by his grace we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. He saved us out of mercy. Remember, by fulfilling all righteousness on our behalf. Now only one who is both God and man can show us mercy like God would, by fulfilling our purpose for us. He had to be God and man. And what comes because of it? He's an heir now because he's fulfilled all righteousness. An heir of what? We saw in Isaiah. He's an heir to everything. Wrap your mind around this. Christ will inherit not only the throne of Jerusalem. His throne may be located in Jerusalem on that day, but he will inherit the entire universe. God will hand over everything, lock and key, to Jesus Christ. And because he's one of us, and because we are now in him, we are also heirs to the same thing. You will inherit the universe. How many kings and emperors have tried to take it, thinking that they were glorious enough to call it, and just to grab it by themselves? How many soldiers had to die to try and fulfill that emperor's dream? How much blood had to be shed? Only the blood of one man had to be shed to secure the universe for you. Only one. Philippians 2.8 He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. I had to throw in this one because, like I said, only a man could die and this verse captures the beauty of God's humility in just a few words. We have a humble and meek God, meek. He could destroy the world with one word from his mouth, but he chose to enter the world as a blue collar carpenter and live in our weaknesses, put up with stomach aches, have to use the bathroom to learn. Think about this. Think about this. The one who spoke. The law to Moses at Mount Sinai had to sit at the feet of a rabbi, a human rabbi, and learn the very law he spoke to Moses thousands of years ago. Does that not blow your mind? He had to learn. This is, he's, it's not, Jesus is not the more than a man. He wasn't born with all the knowledge of the universe. He was born spouting calculus. He had to learn just like you and me. Imagine the humility it would take. We can't. All we can do is try to imagine. The humility it would take to be the first cause of the universe and to humble yourself so low as to have to learn from the very things you created. As to have to subject yourself to a human government. And he did. He did. We have an amazingly humble God. And he is not, he is, hear me, hear me, look at this verse. He is not too proud to get his hands dirty or bloody to do the work to save us. He will do it whatever it takes and he did it whatever it takes. He is not too proud to say, eh, they're not worth it. For some reason we were worth it to this king. And he did the dirty work. And lastly, Hebrews 4, 15. I, there's, you can't go wrong with the book of Hebrews. Every chapter is golden. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. No, no, no. We have one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Church, he knows our highs and lows intimately. He didn't stand, he wasn't in a bubble unto himself. He didn't stand from afar and tell us what to do. He came into our existence and lived our existence, knows our sufferings, knows the pain of loss, knows physical pain very intimately, knows the draw of temptation. I need you to understand what is big. Do not forget, Jesus was tempted. And how tempted do you think you would be when you know you were born to go to the cross if Satan said, here, I'll give you a method of bypassing that and still getting the universe like you were promised. You'll get the end result without this. And Jesus, do you not think that would be just slightly tempting to the Son of God, man, to say, yeah, you got me. Do you not think that Jesus wasn't tempted, didn't feel the draw, yet without sin? He said, no, I may not understand it, but I am going to do my Father's will. And he did. But he didn't do it without becoming familiar with everything we go through every single day. So we can approach the throne with boldness. We don't have to have status. We don't have to wait on a list to gain an audience with the king. We can walk straight into the throne room of heaven as if we were the son himself. As if we were a member of the king's family, which we are, by the way. We can approach the throne anytime we want and ask of God anything we want. Ask and you will receive. Folks, this is wild. It's hard enough to get an audience with an earthly king, and yet we can walk right past the curtain of the Holy of Holies and into the very throne room of God without a care in the world. Because God became a man. He's one of us now. And he will dwell with us forever. I should have taken you to Revelation. The dwelling place of God is with man. God is not going to stay in highest heaven forever looking down upon us. He's going to come down one day and fix everything once and for all. And the dwelling place of God from then on will be with us. God had to become a man to accomplish all of that. And I, I'll never be able to wrap my mind around... I, Sometimes it's just, you don't want to go too far with this. You know, you don't want to dwell too long because this is what happened. People would be amazed by angels and by the, the idea of angels that they would start worshiping angels. This was actually kind of a cult that arose out of Christianity in the early church. They'd start worshiping angels by name that they saw, like Michael and Gabriel and so forth. As a problem, you've, you've, you've got to stop doing that. So what the apostles are saying, you've got to stop looking for Captain America. You've got to stop looking for Thor. Yeah, you've got to stop looking for Superman and worshiping angels. You have to look to the one who was born in a manger. I'll never be able to understand God, Logos, so constricting his being in a way that he would become man. It's not, remember, it's not that it's just the soul of God wearing a meat bag as a disguise. He became man. God is a man now, and yet he's still God. I'll never be able to wrap my mind around that, but boy, am I thankful for this mystery. You bet your bottom dollar I am. If the mystery makes you, perhaps you were uncomfortable. I don't know. Perhaps you were uncomfortable with the idea of God making mistakes, of Jesus having to learn things of his poop not smelling like the rest of ours, right? As being as much a man as you or I, and yet always and forever God. Perhaps that makes you uncomfortable, and that's okay. 
steep in that uncomfortableness because without the incarnation church, we're not a church. Without the incarnation church, we're not sons of God. We're not heirs to anything except our own destruction. Without the God-man, we do not have what we have. What a glorious mystery. There's actually a, there's an ancient hymn, an ancient hymn called, it, it's Latin. Here we go, Latin for you. O Manum Mysterium, it's called. Ancient, words are ancient and countless composers have give, put their own music to the words. But r- roughly translated, it goes something like this. O Manum Mysterium, the title is O Great Mystery. Magnitudinal, there's a good word for you. Magnitudinal mystery. That animals, think about this. O oh, great mystery, that animals should see the newborn Lord lying in a manger. He didn't come in a palace, far away from his subjects. He was born in a cave in a used feeding trough. That animals, besides from his mom and dad, should be the first ones to see the newborn Savior. Blessed be the virgin whose womb was made worthy to bear Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, Heavenly Father, what a marvelous mystery that bird and beasts could see you at your advent, but that you didn't stay hidden in a cave. You came to us and didn't just show us the light, didn't just tell us what to do, because we know we could never do it. You did it for us. Oh, Lord, all we have to pray today is thank you ever so much for doing it for us, for fulfilling the law, for dying, and for resurrecting for us. On the seventh day of Christmas, we confess we are so happy to be your children. Keep that joy alive in our hearts. Whenever it starts to wane, restore the joy of your salvation, just as David prayed. Keep Christmas in our hearts all year round. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with us, please?
Father, we thank you this morning once again that we can come and gather here. Dear Lord, we thank you that, that you are a man, that you were a man. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are our Savior, you are our Lord, you are King and God. Dear Lord, most of all, we thank you that you are our brother and we are co-heirs with you in all that God has given to us. May we go out these doors today into your world, into a brand new year, carrying your love with us, anticipating all the blessings that you have for us throughout this next year. May we go in your love and your peace. Amen. <laughs>